We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall. Welcome to The Meaningful Life. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Podbeam, Amazon Music, and wherever you find your podcasts. It's not just that your partner doesn't get you, but they're really not interested in trying. Perhaps you feel dismissed, undervalued, and starved of intimacy. Meanwhile, your partner feels judged, unappreciated, and anxious. And yet there is love. Your partner is a good person and respected at work. When you tell your friends, they offer reassurance. All marriages are difficult. But the more they talk about their ups and downs, the more you realise your marriage isn't like theirs. It could be that you are one half of a neurodiverse couple, and the missing piece of the jigsaw is that your brains work differently. Unfortunately, it's not easy to get a diagnosis, and many partners are resistant for fear of being stigmatised or blamed for everything. Fortunately, my witness today is an expert on coaching neurodiverse couples. Sarah Swenson is a licensed psychotherapist and holds a master's degree in counselling from Seattle University. I think we should start right at the very beginning and let's define what do you mean or what do we mean by a neurodiversity and a neurodiverse couple? Thank you, Andrew. That's exactly where I start when I work with a couple. What does neurodiversity mean? Because it's a word that is being tossed around now. We hear it. And oftentimes when we do, there's no definition attached. It was a word that was coined actually by an autistic woman working on her master's degree, trying to accommodate an individual like herself that didn't quite fit the mold. And that was the word she described and that has since become the word that we use to describe anything out of the range of what we call neurotypical. And that is a way to describe not a good or a bad brain, not a healthy or a sick brain, It's the most dominant neurotype, it's the neurotypical. The neurodiverse is that other 3 4% of the global population whose brains are structured differently, and as a result, they experience the world differently, and they respond to it differently from how the neurotypical person responds uh, and visualizes reality. That's also very invisible, and we all make the assumption that people think or do or respond the way we do and that that's normal. What happens in a neurodiverse relationship when you have a person who's neurodivergent, diagnosed or otherwise, and a person who's neurotypical, the very basis of their relationship is unspoken. The expectations reside in an unspoken state. And it leads to some dissonance in the relationship that's very puzzling to each partner. So it's important also to remember that when we say neurodiverse, that 3 or 4% we're talking about, it includes autism. It also includes things like dyslexia and other changes in how the brain works regarding information and responding to it. In my work, when I say neurodiverse, I'm talking about a couple in whom one partner is what we call neurotypical and the other is autistic. So my work is specifically with individuals who are autistic and neurotypical. And I will say that the majority of the couples with whom I work have an undiagnosed partner who identifies as possibly autistic. So we say, let's use that frame and see if it helps. And I think we need to also define autism because there's been a a big change as far as autism is concerned. There used to be two categories. There was Asperger's and autistic, and there's been a change with that. Often people say that somebody's on the spectrum. So perhaps you can tell us about those terms as well. So we get them all cleared up at the beginning. Absolutely. And that's another aspect of popular culture that makes this topic confusing because these terms are thrown about without any kind of attached clinical understanding or meaning. And so there's a lot of vagaries and there's a lot of misconceptions. So 
Right now in the United States, as of 2013, the American Psychiatric Association rolled what used to be diagnosed as Asperger's syndrome into the current diagnosis, which here in the, in the United States now is autism spectrum disorder. That's what we call it. That is a full range. The spectrum in that diagnosis doesn't refer to the spectrum between being autistic and being neurotypical, which is a common misconception. The spectrum refers to the degree to which the traits of autism affect an individual, the degree to which they're present and the degree to which they're expressed. So that's the spectrum part. And when people say on the spectrum, that really comes out of movies and television. And it's a very shallow understanding that's usually accompanied with stereotypes that are incomplete at best, if not actually inaccurate. Now, one of the problems I've experienced working with couples in this sort of kind of area is if you meet one neurodivergent person, you've sort of met one neurodivergent person, whereas effectively most neurotypical people sort of tend to respond in the same kind of way. Each neurotypical person is completely different from the others. It's really quite difficult to actually say they're like this or they're like that. Has that been your experience too? You're going right down the list of where I start when I first meet a couple with these questions, Andrew. The the, the statement that I use is if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. And sometimes people are going to take that aback because they're logged into those stereotypes I mentioned a minute ago. And we look at that because one of the important things to understand is what are these changes that we see in the brain compared to the neurotypical brain that what are we talking about? What areas of the brain are involved and what is the effect of having those differences? So when I work with couples, we get pretty granular in that information because it's important that each partner understand their own way of being. So we not only talk about what is the range of difference relative to neurotypical in the autistic brain. And, and what the degree of traits are and the degree of expression of those traits. But then we also look at the so-called neurotypical, which is the most underexamined because it's the most prevalent. That's the water in our fishbowl. That's the world we've created, all countries in the world, to answer questions neurotypical people have, to meet needs that neurotypical people have. And all of our social contracts, which are invisible, are designed to facilitate neurotypical communication and needs. And that is the realm of the unspoken. So how do I, as a neurotypical person, communicate in a way that is just a complete nut a puzzle to somebody who's neurodivergent? Oh, this is something that comes up all the time, because at the root, as you can imagine, of the challenges that couples experience when they ask to work with me, the cup in which it all happens is communication. And it can be very baffling because there's, again, the degrees of effectiveness of these autistic traits. Some autistic individuals can't understand any figurative speech at all. If you say, well, you really hit it out of the park, the person will say, well, why did you change the subject to talk about baseball? And then the neurotypical partner is saying, well, I wasn't talking about baseball. I was just telling you, you hit a home run. Well, and then it goes, even, you know, well, I didn't, we're not playing baseball. It can get really off the rails in a very confusing way for couples. So the figurative speech is one area where communication goes awry. But another area that really is pervasive is in the area of nonverbal communication. And that really is estimated to be as high as 70% of the information that we exchange among ourselves. And again, to varying degrees, that information that includes facial expression, tone of voice, posture, gesture with hands, leaning in, pulling back, all the things that your body does. For some autistic individuals who do very well in other aspects of their life, are professionals, etc., that's an invisible realm. And they're relying exclusively on that 30% that is the content, the definitional content of the language that's being used. And one of the things they often say is, why can't you say what you mean? Yeah. And how don't we say what we mean? As I'm assuming you're neurotypical as well. I am, yeah. That's one of the things that comes up many times, and there are a lot of variations on the answer to that question. One of them can simply mean it can refer to the use of figurative speech, 
right, where it's just baffling to jump orbit, if you will, to go from some of the literal meaning of something and then to go into hyperbole that seems off the point to an autistic individual who doesn't have that tendency. On the neurotypical side, I think we are really under aware of how often we utilize figurative speech when we're talking. And the assumption, of course, is that that's going to communicate our intention accurately, because generally speaking, it does. But it doesn't with a person who's autistic who struggles to understand the atypical content of speech. And I think we are sort of brought up a lot as children, you know, I want doesn't get. And so you sort of don't ask directly for things. You sort of ask indirectly. You sort of think they know what I mean. You know, if I say, actually, I don't want anything special for my birthday, they... (laughs) Oh, those are cutting words. We sort of know that our partner is not going to believe us. They know that really we want a surprise birthday party. We want to go to the Ritz and hopefully we'll come home in a Rolls Royce sort of kind of thing. (laughs) Yeah, that that does too. But if you say that to somebody on the spectrum, they're going to take you at your word, aren't they? 99% of the time. And really the response then when the neurotypical partner is disappointed The autistic person says, but you said you didn't want any kind of notice or celebration. And so she, the neurotypical partner, if it's a woman, she's hurt. If it's, let's say it's the man, the autistic partner, he's confused, but he's also hurt. Because now he doesn't understand what he did wrong and what he missed. So that can spiral into guilt and shame on his side. And on her side, it can go from hurt to resentment. Because this kind of misunderstanding comes up often. The example that I use is if a couple is in the car and they've been driving for a while and the woman, the passenger says, the neurotypical passenger says, oh, there's a restaurant. Well, she's not just saying that's a restaurant, although that's all he hears. What she's saying is, I'm hungry, I could use lunch. And he's not likely to pick that up. And she might repeat it again. There's another restaurant. Or finally, she'll say, how many restaurants do we have to pass before we stop to eat? And that is the same kind of thing. He didn't hear that question. That question wasn't asked. And that statement wasn't made. She didn't say, I'm hungry. I'd like to stop for lunch. So, And this is where a neurotypical partner can really be helpful to understand that her autistic partner needs that direct language. That intuiting meaning is a challenge because your language will be taken literally. So help us understand what's going on in the, that somebody who is on the autistic spectrum, how their brain is working, how they communicate. Well, it's important to contextualize this, especially with my work, because I work with the couples, not just one partner or the other, is that we're not talking about pathology, We're not talking about mental illness. We're not talking about what used to be called in the United States personality disorders. It still is, but diagnosed differently. What we're talking about is the difference in the structure of the brain, as I mentioned earlier, the way that it it receives information and responds to it. And you can see those differences on a fMRI, by the way, different areas of the brains light up at different times and to different degrees. So this is not an imaginary thing. It's a very real physical thing. And what one of the areas in which the big differences show up is in language and communication, understanding the literal meaning of words and communicating very directly because One of the great rewards of being autistic is the ability to see right to the end of the sentence very clearly and express something very clearly and very unambiguously. Neurotypical language is very ambiguous for reasons we've just discussed, but autistic language typically is really A, B, C. It's a very structured and comprehensible way of expressing yourself. That's also the way that an autistic person expects to receive information. And when it's all over the place with, you know, figments of imagination from the other speaker, it's, that's one reason it goes off the rails. But the autistic person really needs that more orderly approach because the autistic orientation to this reality of ours is cognitive. It's almost exclusively cognitive, which means that things are sorted out in a thought process. It's a literal thought process. That also explains something else that we see that couples don't understand, just by the way, which is the latency difference in these, the way these two brains work. 
the neurotypical brain processes faster because it's also got the whole base of intuition to which it can apply a situation and come up with a rapid assessment. The autistic brain is more like laying a brick path. You have to build that brick first as a thought and then the next brain. This isn't related to intelligence. That's another thing that's really imperative. This is not related at all to intellectual capacity. It's a processing speed difference. So how did you get into this particular specialism? That is a very good question because as I'm sure you know, Andrew, there aren't very many of us who do this particular work. And when I started my private practice as a therapist in Seattle, Washington, I was in what we call the South Lake Union neighborhood, which is on one of our lakes in Seattle. At the south end of it also happens to be the home of some of the biggest tech companies in the world. So all (laughs) all of them converge. And I opened my practice to work with individuals of high intelligence because that was my background. I'm a member of Mensa myself. And it just seemed like a path that I could see where the challenges reside, and I thought maybe I had something that would be very supportive to individuals who might be struggling for reasons related to that. Well, I had all these brilliant engineers coming into me from all these tech companies whose names you all, everybody knows, and what they wanted to talk about was their relationships. And what that meant was that we don't communicate. I just wish he wasn't angry all the time. I wish she wasn't angry all the time. I can't make her happy. She wants sex all the time. Why don't I want sex? I love her, but I need my time alone. And all of a sudden, I started to realize, well, the challenges here don't really relate to being intelligent. It's not about that at all. It's about something else. And I began to explore that myself as a clinician, and I realized that these clients that I was working with were actually autistic as well. Undiagnosed, practically 90% of them. Most adults with whom I work are self-diagnosed, just as a matter of information. So we started looking at things that way. So it's almost like if you're a photographer and you bring your lens into focus and all of a sudden you realize how sharp your vision can be. That's the experience that I kept having reinforced with my clients who were telling me, well, you know, if I look at things that way, it starts to make sense. And then we started working with the partners. And then I realized where my heart really lies and where my particular gifts could really be utilized well, because I do have personal experience in my life with autistic adults. So again, it kind of like working with the high intelligence coming out of men's and myself. It just felt like I was grounded in a field that is a very challenging field because you have to understand the neurotypical side and you have to understand the autistic side without bias. So you say you have a personal experience. Is that a partner or a parent? In my case, it was a partner. A long-term partner, yes. Mm -hmm. And I struggled to make sense of things all through my marriage, which I never did make sense of, frankly. And it wasn't until much later when I began to work with couples myself, as I mentioned how my practice evolved, that I started to put together the pieces in my own life in a way that made sense and actually led me to some very deep compassion for my former husband, which, Mm. of course, is the goal that I try to bring to all the couples I work with. And, I mean, I think that is so important in this area because there can be a huge amount of judgment, not from a bad place, Mm -hmm. but from just a desperate place because Mm -hmm. this is a really difficult field. And I can see in your eyes at the moment that this is difficult to think back on. It is because... Like so many of my clients, I look back with deep regret for not having understood things, for mis- having misinterpreted, misjudged, misreading intention. Because what happens is you get into a, f- you're kind of in a fulcrum. You have the hurt, and then you also know this is a good person who doesn't intend to hurt you. So how do you square that? And that question is really at the core of this work. And it goes in both directions. It's not just the neurotypical partner who has that experience. It's the autistic partner as well. And uh, it's a difficult relationship. It is not an impossible relationship, I realize now. But I certainly did not realize that earlier in my life. Yeah. 
And, you know, I would say when I work with couples like this, that it is more intense work, but it's also incredibly rewarding because you can really make a difference because it's all down to communication. And sometimes having a referee that can stop people going into the same old loop and yeah. say, we know this doesn't work. Let's stop. Let's take a step back. Let's find a different way of doing it. And right. if the message hasn't got across, and I think this is one that both Sarah and I want to put across, is if you're recognising anything about yourself, there is no judgment in this. It's just a bit like saying one person's right hand and the other person's left handed. It's really just yeah. like that. That's right. I agree. Absolutely agree. And actually removing that judgmental framework is an initial phases of the work because those judgments are kind of hardwired if couples have been together for a long time. So disassembling that is really a part of getting rid of the weight of history and, uh, and making couples understand it doesn't have to be predictive if they can understand new ways of communicating, understanding each other, and accommodating their differences. Now, Let's imagine that somebody listening to this program is going, hmm, I wonder if my partner is neurodiverse. What sort of things do you think they should be looking out for to see if they're heading in the right direction or not? That is a really good question. And one of the things that I find, Andrew, is that by the time couples have contacted me, and it's generally the neurotypical partner, by the way, who contacts me, <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. Um, but by what the time a surprise. They get, yeah. <laughs> by the time they get to that point, they've often had two very different experiences about the nature of their relationship. The autistic partner tends to say, everything's fine. Why is she so angry all the time? But I'm fine. I've yet to see a couple in which it's the autistic partner who initiates a divorce. I've never seen it happen. Yeah, that's just my experience, but I've never seen it. So the neurotypical partner generally is really, she's talked to her friends. She's talked to her family. She's observed other couples in public for signs of affection that she doesn't have. And she watches in the triangulation with the children. And she watches with confusion. How, I mean, he's a skilled neurosurgeon and he's loved and admired by people around the world. And when he gets home, Everything disappears. Who is this man? He's a good person. I love him. And so they've gone through a lot of, or, you know, conversely, I don't understand. He can't keep a job. And when he does, he's he's terrible with money. I mean, it's a full, again, a full spectrum of challenges that just don't make sense to the neurotypical partner. So here's what I would say to somebody who's thinking, hmm, first of all, As a caveat, be careful about what you read online because so much of it is personal experience that's uninformed by clinical support. And it can be judgmental and really not helpful to anybody who's struggling to make sense of of his or her own relationship. I say his or her because there is a small proportion of the couples with whom I work in which it is the woman who's autistic. That's not generally the way autism is distributed in the population, but that constellation is generally, I would say, probably 90, 95% neurotypical. And women, I think, on the spectrum are better at hiding it, to be perfectly honest, as well. Well, you know, that's a complicated question, and the word masking comes up a lot with regard to that question. And it has to do, really, at least in, in these Western cultures, um, the United States, which I'm familiar with, or Italy, with, which I'm familiar, the differences in the way that girls are socialized and the way that boys are socialized, and just some of the real differences between boy children and girl children how they play with each other, the development of their musculature and their physicality is the different paces, all these things. It allows girls to create a, a space in which performing as if is way easier because there's a lot more information about nuanced behavior in the girls' networks and the expectations parents and teachers have of girls as they're growing up is just very different. Boys grow up in a more linear fashion and they don't oftentimes... I mean, obviously, there are families where this is not the case. But generally speaking, boys don't have that intuitive emotional support in their social upbringing. And even in schools, even in enlightened schools, you can still see the disparity sometimes in how a boy is treated by a teacher and how a girl is for the same maybe infraction. 
So this gives a girl who's autistic and undiagnosed a lot more information about being what she might call normal behaviorally so that she doesn't stand out the way an autistic boy might stand out. However, her interior world is equally stressed because every single exchange she has has to be calibrated and considered and there's effort involved. And she's never just like the boys, never quite sure she's got it right. And sometimes she doesn't. So she can also get a reputation as being quirky, a little odd. The, oh, that kind of language isn't as judgmental typically with girls as it is with boys. Boys get bullied terribly. And girls, also autistic girls, get bullied, but not to the degree that autistic boys do. So you've got these suspicions How do you approach your partner without them hearing you're the problem? And that's the first question that women ask me when they contact me, when they want to talk about whether working with me would be helpful, because that's the first step. And what I tell, let's say, a woman who asks that question, which is a very sensitive and loving question, by the way, is to remember that if you're talking about the possibility of working with me or somebody who does this work, that the client, if you will, is the relationship, right? It's the space between the two individuals in which the relationship takes place. So we're not looking to blame anybody or point fingers. What we're trying to look at is what consistently challenges the two of you that keeps you from feeling the love you'd like to feel, to keeps you from feeling connected the way you want it? feel. Then we look at what they identify. And generally, the first thing is communication. So I say, well, what you might tell your partner is just what I just said, that it's the relationship that's the client. I'm not an advocate for either. I'm the advocate for both, which means the relationship. And that the challenges are challenges you each are going to be experiencing and talking about. So What your interest is in bringing this to your partner's attention is to heal some of the wounds that you're feeling in your relationship because you want to heal the wounds. You want to stay together. You want to increase that feeling of connectedness. I don't suggest using words like autism or spectrum or neurodivergence in that original conversation because that's not the point of the original conversation. The point of the original conversation is, can we look under the hood here of this relationship? Although, don't say that to your autistic partner. <laughs> that's that's a, a euphemism I wouldn't recommend. Well, remembering that what you're suggesting is that you work together to heal the wounds in your relationship requires, first of all, identifying them and finding somebody who's going to be able to support both sides of the conversation in a way. It makes each of you feel heard, respected, and represented to the other partner. So that's where it's so important that when you do seek counseling or therapy, that you find somebody who has experience working with neurodiverse couples. That's one of the reasons. The other body of reasons that I hear over and over again, unfortunately, is the woundedness that comes out of previous counseling experiences with well-meaning and skilled therapists who don't recognize or understand neurodiversity when they see it. Because our traditional couple modalities are, generally speaking, insight-based and emotion-focused. And those are two of the areas in which that lag time that I was talking about earlier in the processing, those are two of the challenge areas for the autistic partner. A therapist oftentimes misinterprets that as reluctance or non-participation or unwillingness to engage with what the other partner is saying. And the neurotypical partner, meanwhile, is ramping up, trying to get some sort of reaction. And it, it, just, it doesn't look like what it is to a therapist who doesn't recognize neurodiversity. And sometimes uh, the neurotypical partner comes away with some serious misdiagnoses as a result of looking like the whining victim, which is just not the case. It's important. You can use it in any of the search directories for therapists. If you use the word neurodiversity, as you're looking for a therapist, I really believe that's imperative. And certainly ask the question, what's your experience with neurodiverse couples? Yeah. 
Absolutely. Secondly, though, I would want to know what the therapist's goal for treatment would be. Because it's not realistic to tell neurodiverse couples that we'll patch you up and you'll be on your way. That's not the way this works. My goal with couples is to help them understand themselves and each other and where the challenges are created by the differences. And I think also what is possible and what is not possible as well. And that's exactly the next step. Because some things can change and some things can't. So ultimately, the question, after we've been working together, the question, the work goes toward this question. What can you live with? What degree of confusion and misunderstanding can you live with? What kind of repair conversations can we have that can help you with communication challenges like that? But the other side of that question is, what can't you live without? Getting to that question is actually the goal of the work I do with couples. Because this isn't the end point. This is the groundwork for the decisions that couples make when they have a better idea of who they are and who they are together. And they start to look forward to the rest of their lives. How can we accommodate what we now know in a way that allows us to live with the stuff we can manage what about this other what about this other piece? Well, I think the best way to understand this is to go into, as you would say, granular detail. And very kindly, I have a letter from somebody who's not only provided us with a very good case history, but some very good questions to answer as well. And we're going to be looking at that letter and answering those questions in just a moment. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. How can I help you have a better relationship? There's nothing I like better than talking to some of the world's top sex and relationship experts. It helps me learn and grow. And that's why I've started this podcast. But what makes my life meaningful is writing and teaching. That's why I've written 20 books on relationships, which have been translated into 20 languages. They fall into two categories. Firstly, improve your relationships. In this category, I'd like to recommend Happy Couple Handbook, powerful love hacks for a successful relationship. I cover constructive arguing, be a better listener, use carrots rather than sticks, and how to forgive and move on. In the second category, which is called Rescue Your Relationship, I have books like I Love You But I'm Not In Love With You, my international bestseller, Can We Start Again? 50 Questions to Fall Back In Love, My Wife Doesn't Love Me Anymore, and My Husband Doesn't Love Me Anymore and He's Texting Someone Else. You can find out more about these books, along with details about how to get involved with the show and send in your question to be discussed with my guests at my website, www.andrewgmarshall.com. When clients come to you to shape their financial portfolios, they're not really asking about numbers and accounts. They're seeking guidance to help goals become reality. Luckily for them, you've got Thrivent Asset Management, and together we're always looking at what's ahead. Designed with long-term opportunity in mind, our investment options can help you realize the difference an active management approach can have on your clients' futures. We'll even work with you to see how our variety of investment products can help meet your clients' needs. Thrive in Asset Management. We invest in potential. Click the banner to learn more about Thrive in Asset Management or visit thriventfunds.com slash advisor. That's thriventfunds.com slash advisor. Thrivent Asset Management, a division of Thrivent, offers financial professionals a variety of investment products to help meet their clients' needs. Thrivent Distributors, LLC, member FINRA SIPC, is a subsidiary of Thrivent, the marketing name for Thrivent Financial for Lutherans. I think one of the things that makes this program so wonderful is 
just how kind people are with sharing the things that they're going through with me. Let's look at this letter that I've been sent today. And if you'd like to send me something that you're going through, and I will see if I can find the right expert for it. If you go to my website, www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, you'll find a space where we have participate in the program. You can also find out how to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life and get all of our juicy bonus material. So here's the letter. For two and a half years, I've been in a relationship with someone who has turned my inner world into a never experienced state of neediness and uncontrolled emotions. I'm 34 years old and my boyfriend is 38. In several online tests, he scored at the low end of the neurodiverse range. I feel strongly attracted to him in many ways, above all because he's a person with a sharp and independent mind. He reflects me and my flaws like no one did before, and I feel I can grow a lot in this relationship. At the same time, I often get into painful emotional states of feeling disconnected and insecure about his love and affection for me. He has a rich inner world of dreams and desires. He rarely shares what concerns him and doesn't show a lot of interest in my perspective or opinion on things. When conflicts arise, he is bluntly honest and the opposite of a pleaser. He doesn't give a lot of compliments or intimate looks that lovers do and is skilled at voicing criticisms about me. In couple therapy with him, I learned to communicate my needs more clearly and directly towards him. That helped a lot and I appreciate all the things he's begun to change for me. Still, I feel a great imbalance in the relationship as it's always me uttering needs for more body contact or communication. I sometimes feel more like a burden than someone who is a desirable partner. With previous boyfriends, I was used to being strongly, emotionally and physically desired and an appreciated conversation partner in their life. So before I come on to the questions, do you recognise this letter? If I were asked to write a composite of the letters I've received over the years, this would come pretty close to being that letter. Yeah. So this is not an unusual situation to be in, is it? Not at all. And in fact, the writer of this letter hit several points, which over the course of the work that I do become big topics to open up. It's increasingly painful, as this writer points out. It becomes increasingly painful and increasingly confusing to the neurotypical partner who loves her partner. Right? You, you don't hear it in this letter, and I just seldom hear it either. You don't hear, and I'm about ready to walk out the door. You know, she's not expressing anger. She's expressing confusion because she loves them, and she can't make sense of this disparate input that she gets. And what I would say is, and we're saying there's no such thing as a typical person who's neurodiverse, but often they feel overwhelmed. They don't feel safe to express feelings because often their attempts to communicate will be all wrong and make the whole situation worse. Yeah. Generally, because they're going to be coming from an intellectual point of view. And if somebody's coming from an emotional point of view, that just makes them more upset. So both partners are finding this hard. Very important point. Yeah. So the questions from this woman is the first one. Why am I craving for connection and intimacy and he isn't? The answer to this question, I can give you a broad answer with a lot of variables in it. What's important to know, though, is that the answer to this particular question is going to be unique to every couple. Because this is an area in which those variable traits of autism really come to the fore. You know, if you think of intimacy as the realm of connection, as feeling that what women tell me oftentimes is, I just want him to have my back. And what they mean is they just, they want somebody that feels like he's beside her, that is there for her. All of the, I feel heard, I feel seen, all that kind of language. And that's intimacy. That's what we call intimacy. That's why we engage in these couple relationships is to have that special intimate relationship. So a neurotypical partner engages in the relationship with those expectations that could even be subliminal. And all of a sudden, over time, they're not being met. It's very confusing to her. And it feels like rejection. 
as well. So there's two tracks happening. There's the rejection part, as this client alluded to, when she's talking about previous relationships where she felt desirable and physically and conversationally. The implication there is that she doesn't feel that way in this relationship. So that's not good for her self-esteem. That really chips away at her sense of who she is and, as she mentioned, how desirable she is. These are important factors for a woman in a serious relationship. But is he not craving connection and intimacy? On some level, most people who come to see me and are prepared to come week after week with their partner, they want it too. The ones that don't want it come once and that's it. But if they continue to come, they're there. The fact they're sitting on the sofa is their way of saying, yeah, I want this too. It's just they're not communicating it in the same way. Well, I think that that describes, obviously, as well, the couples with whom I work, that the autistic partner wants it too. What what it comes down to oftentimes is that the word intimacy means different things to each partner. This letter, for example, is descriptive of the neurotypical woman's understanding of intimacy. It involves communication and it also involves an active and loving sexual relationship. But intimacy to the autistic partner could mean something very different. It can be more like the comfort of parallel play, right? Which is the stability of, I know she's here for me and I'm here for her. And what that means is we're in this house, we have this plan, we we all do these things together, we rely on each other, we eat dinner together, we go places together. That's the kind of stability that can equate to intimacy for a lot of autistic individuals. But He keeps hearing from his partner, well, that's not intimacy, that we may as well be roommates. So that's very confusing. And the autistic partner wants to understand, how can I move into her space in a way that helps her feel that I want what she wants? Well, he likely doesn't. That's the problem. That's one of the what can't you live without categories is right here. So that area is confusing. And, you know, I can help an autistic person say things to his partner that align with the notion of intimacy. But the neurotypical partner will most likely never experience that as the spontaneous gesture of love that is what she means that she's craving when she says intimacy. I think we get... To the next question, really, from what you've just said, which is, what is the growth potential in such a relationship? Again, this question shows me the orientation of this person who wrote the letter is toward healing the relationship. And I credit her for that. She's not giving up. She loves her partner. The growth potential, and this is another common question that I get all the time, is, you know, sort of a version of, can we fix this? Can we change enough so that we are okay? And this goes back to what I was saying earlier, that helping a couple understand the basics of the challenges in language and communication and expectations and intention versus effect of behavior, we can do all of those things. But we get to a point where they're still going to I mean, with luck, they're going to get to the point of compassion and understanding for each other and themselves. And they're going to be at that fork in the road where that question comes up, what can I live with and what can't we live without? And for a neurodiverse couple, though, that doesn't necessarily mean stay married or get divorced. There's a whole range of reconfiguring a relationship that couples create. I think it's unique to the neurodiverse relationship, but there's a full range. Some couples, for example, agree that They love each other, they love each other's company, and they want to continue to stay together married as roommates. And so they have, they actually create schedules. We'll have dinner together Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, On Saturday morning, we'll do stuff together. And then Saturday afternoon and Sunday, I'm going to do my stuff, you do yours. And that works very well. It can work until it doesn't. And then that question comes up again, but it's kind of a progression of let's see how we can stay together because we love each other. Let's see how we can make it work. If you get to the point where it can't work anymore, then you look at your relationship with compassion and make changes that you may need to make. And what I would say is the growth potential in such a relationship for each individual is actually really rather large because having to look at yourself and understand yourself and learn how to communicate better and develop compassion for yourself and your partner, I mean, these are 
huge journeys of growth. So I think there's a lot of growth potential. Some of it's going to be for you individually and some of it's going to be for you and your partner. That's a very good point. And I agree 100%. The growth in the relationship is variable, as we've said, but the individual growth can be profound. So let's go to the third question. I experienced my boyfriend becoming more careful in what to say to not hurt me when answering questions on for us difficult matters honestly. It seems to me that empathy and honesty are often not compatible in the world of neurodivergent persons. If that is so, why? That also is a good point. Let's take the uh, question of honesty first. This comes up a lot with work with autistic individuals, and it's very confusing for many autistic individuals because the literal kind of thinking, the cognitive processing that we were talking about earlier, it generally doesn't occur to an autistic person to misrepresent his perception of reality. It doesn't occur to him. The reason that it might look like that's what he's doing isn't because of how he's perceiving things. It could be because he wants to please his partner, which is not the same as lying. I mean, that is a categorically different way of misrepresenting something. So that's part of the work that I do is try to help couples untangle that piece. But the drive for the autistic person is toward honesty. And one of the imperatives that guides every autistic person I've ever met is the notion of justice, fairness. And that honesty comes out of that. Now, that's a big area for the conversation. The, the other is regarding empathy and But when I work with couples, what we talk about is the different kinds of empathy. We have what we call cognitive empathy, which is one kind. And then we have what we call the affective empathy, which is another. And they're distinctly different. The affective kind of empathy is generally what neurotypical women are talking about when they ask questions like this about empathy, because they're not feeling that they're partner is feeling with them or getting the emotional subtext of a situation. They feel like that just is inaccessible information. And so they feel very lonely in that. And then often what I hear is all he wants to do is fix it. He doesn't want to listen to what's upsetting. He wants to fix it. Well, the urge to fix it is actually cognitive empathy. It's a way for an autistic person to say, I love you. You're in pain. Let's get you out of here let's get you out of this pain. Let's fix it. But what I help couples understand is if he can learn a few things to say, like, I can sense this is upsetting you, even though he may not know why or what or what degree, if he can at least identify to her that he hears the distress, he hears the heightened emotion, and he's seeking more information, then his efforts to solve the problem or fix it with the cognitive empathy, will come in and she'll be able to hear it. She'll be able to hear it as empathy. So that's one of the big parts of the work that we do, is helping the autistic partner. How's about this idea I I heard the other day? Would it be helpful for the person who is neurodiverse to say, do you want to be helped? Do you want to be heard? Or do you want to be hugged? So they can actually ask, what do you want from me? Helped, hugged, or heard? Exactly. And I I use that as well, that very sentence, because one of the things that the autistic person really needs is information that he can't intuit. And so this is the way of really narrowing the focus for him of what's going to be expected of me now. What do I, what am I supposed to do now? So that's very helpful. It's also, though, hard for the neurotypical partner because in that moment, that's not what she wants to be talking about. She wants a hug or she wants him to just do the thing. So it takes effort and change on both sides to create that peace. Yeah. But let's work with what's possible rather than what we want. Exactly. I'm I'm sorry if I was a bit tart there, but, um, you know, I think we have to live with what's possible. What are neurodivergent persons mostly looking for when engaging in a relationship? That's our fourth question. Well, the reason that that question is important is not so much because of the answer, but because it's a valid question Mm. in that it's going to be very different 
from what the neurotypical partner is expecting or needing. And because both sets of expectation are likely unspoken during courtship and the initial phases of the relationship, their expectations and their, and their almost guiding principles, but they're very seldom articulated. What do you expect from, what do you need from a relationship? Couples generally don't ask each other those questions. And so, as we were talking about earlier, the qualities that most autistic individuals articulate to me that they're looking for is a person they can admire and respect, who has skills and talents that they think are important, who can provide the security of the shared life, the constancy of and the predictability of always being there and setting schedules together. And then the notion of sharing experiences, which for the autistic partner might feel more like uh, what we call parallel play with kids, where you can be watching a movie together or he's on his lap and she's on hers, but they're in the same space. So these are really the rewarding aspects of relationship for an autistic partner broadly speaking, because one of the things that partner also needs is time alone and to engage in interests as well as to reset because all of this stuff being autistic in the neurotypical world is exhausting. And that reset recovery time is really critical. Yeah. They need downtime. Absolutely. Yeah. And the final question is, persons on the neurodiverse spectrum seem to lead rather an isolated life in a world of a neurotypical majority. Can a neurotypical partner be of any help? That's a compound question. The first part is to remember that the differences between the needs of these two partners, and this isn't going to pertain to everybody, it never does, nothing does, but if your partner and not all autistic individuals are, but if your partner is what we call introverted, that partner needs the downtime to recover after social engagement. And if that partner is also autistic, that downtime, that reset time is critical for other reasons. And so there may not be the desire to participate socially the way that the neurotypical partner assumes is normal, right? That's part of the challenge that she, this question has a little bit of that assumption that he's not acting in a normal way. Can I kind of help him with stuff that he doesn't ordinarily know how to do? And I think that assumption is generally false, but it's something that you really would benefit from exploring with your partner. Because you may find that your partner would be perfectly happy if you went with your girlfriends to watch a movie and he could stay at home. Or he may say, you know, I'd love to go to that cocktail party with you, but I don't know what to wear. I'm uncomfortable making small talk. Can you give me some pointers? I I don't know. I mean, how much of this buffet stuff am I expected to eat? Do I have to eat it? Who's going to be there? When can we leave? How long? All these very real questions. It might be easier for him just to say, no, you go ahead. But really, you could help him by giving him a lot of information that can help him actually make a decision to participate. I don't know if you've heard of the pop star Gary Newman. He was very successful in the UK in the 70s and 80s. I interviewed him. He's into electronic music and computers and is very much on the spectrum. And his wife would describe her job as Newman relations or human relations. She would help him navigate things. And so, for example, I arrived to the interview with the both of them in their house and he made me a cup of tea. He didn't drink tea and he was sort of really curious about whether he'd made it correctly because she had told him to offer somebody a cup of tea if they when they arrived wow. mm-hmm. and had taught him how to do it. So he didn't feel awkward when somebody arrived and she wasn't there. Exactly. What a loving thing for her to be able to give to him The important thing, though, is that's something he wanted her to help him with. If it's the expectation of the neurotypical partner, but that is, here's what you need to do, but he's not inclined to want to do it, then that's really forcing a neurotypical expectation on him. But if it's something that he's appreciative of, like this gesture of making a guest comfortable, I've had the same kind of thing with when somebody knocks on your door, what do you say? Where the partner helped the autistic partner just with that little bit of small talk that was so difficult for him to do without her help. 
Well, I hope that has been helpful and thank you very much for the letter. We have almost finished the main part of the programme. We're going to be continuing in a moment. But before we finish this section, I have to say thank you very much, Sarah, for being my guest on The Meaningful Life, being a witness for what makes life meaningful. And therefore, I have to ask you, what makes your life meaningful? Well, first, it's really, it's been a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk about this work, Andrew. I know you work with neurodiverse couples as well, and that you know as well as I do how much support most of us therapists could be offering to these couples. So it's a pleasure to talk about the work. There's a lot more we could say, of course. My life is meaningful for a number of reasons. One is because my work derives from struggles that I have faced myself. And I think anyone who understands that equation knows what I'm talking about, that if you can learn from your own life in a way that makes you generative and helpful in the lives of others, it really feels like a natural kind of energetic flow. And it gives my life meaning in that part of my world. But I also have a loving partner, and I have daughters who are married with young children, so I'm a grandmother, and I have friends whom I love, and I'm ever curious about the things I don't know. I love that idea of sort of paying on. You know, you couldn't sort out the problems in your own first marriage, but you're helping other people and you're passing it on. And I think that's a beautiful thing to do. As I say, this is not where the conversation ends because I'd like to talk to Sarah about the work she immediately, originally intended to do, the problems of being highly intelligent or gifted. So we'll be talking about that in a moment. If you want to hear that bonus material, you can subscribe directly via Apple or Spotify. We're also available on Amazon Music. If you want to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life and get all our lovely bonus material, here are the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you. When clients come to you to shape their financial portfolios, they're not really asking about numbers and accounts. They're seeking guidance to help goals become reality. Luckily for them, you've got Thrivent Asset Management, and together we're always looking at what's ahead. Designed with long-term opportunity in mind, our investment options can help you realize the difference an active management approach can have on your clients' futures. We'll even work with you to see how our variety of investment products can help meet your clients' needs. Thrive in Asset Management. We invest in potential. Click the banner to learn more about Thrive in Asset Management or visit thriventfunds.com slash advisor. That's thriventfunds.com slash advisor. Thrivent Asset Management, a division of Thrivent, offers financial professionals a variety of investment products to help meet their clients' needs. Thrivent Distributors, LLC, member FINRA SIPC, is a subsidiary of Thrivent, the marketing name for Thrivent Financial for Lutherans.